Good morning. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you to the Lord's house as we begin the whole Lord's Day together. Several things you need to be aware of today. First of all, if you're visiting with us, we're thankful you're here. Look right in front of you now and you'll see a blue card in the pew rack in front of you. Take that blue card and fill it out. Drop it in the offering plate later in our service. That's how we can get to know you and greet you properly. Today is a celebratory day in the life of Woodruff Road. It all began in 1979 when three local pastors, Mac Bonner from Fairview, Dwight Noy from Friendship, Paul Settle from Second Pres, began to talk about planting a church in what was then known as the Golden Strip area. They sp spoke to Reuben Wallace about being the church planter, and he was able to preach for two months and then was called away to full-time work with Presbyterian Evangelistic Fellowship. The Golden Strip mission seemed to be hanging by a thread. And Gordon Hauser, a retired, a retired missionary at Second Press downtown, said he would preach for a few weeks until someone else could be found. For six years, he preached weekly at this church. In late 1985, the Presbytery asked Dr. Tom Cross to come and assume the leadership, and it was under his leadership that Woodruff Road was particularized. That's Presbyterian speak for we elected our first elders, became a freestanding congregation, on this Sunday, June 1986, 35 years ago. So today, we want to boast in God's faithfulness and what he has done. But it's also a great day for Sandy and I. We are celebrating our 21st anniversary at Woodruff Road and our 34th anniversary in the ministry. And so this is just like a big party day for us. We want to today express our gratitude to all those people who labored last week to make our Vacation Bible School a marvelous ministry. Thank you for your sacrificial efforts last week. And we want to tell you that this week is a busy week for the men of Woodruff Road. Uh, tomorrow night, men, you are invited to play basketball in the gym if your insurance is paid up. And then we have our Tuesday morning men's study group, our Thursday night Low Country Boil at the home of Roger and Janet Godwin. Then this Wednesday night, as normal, is our, our dinner at 545, followed by catechids for preschoolers and elementary schoolers, our youth group for middle and high schoolers, and adult prayer. And then today, following this service and refreshments in the Fellowship Hall, join us for our excellent Sunday school classes. If you're a, a college student home for the summer, uh, come to our College Plus class in the library taught by Silas Menezes. If you're visiting, just checking us out, go to our intro to Woodruff Road class that meets right back there behind the glass windows taught by Pastor Dodds today. He'll be teaching on a subject of perpetual interest, that of baptism. And then we would deeply encourage you to, to keep the whole Lord's Day holy and to close out the Lord's Day with us tonight at 6 p.m. as we gather in worship and as we'll be considering uh, continuing in our series on the life of Samuel. During a, a New York Philharmonic Symphony concert at the crescendo of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, a concert goer's cell phone began to ring very loudly with that obnoxious type of ring that maybe on your phone. The conductor stopped the performance, turned around, and asked the person to quiet their phone. And the most fascinating social exercise broke out. People all around the gentleman whose phone it was began to shout, find him a thousand dollars, throw him out. So if these people recognized it was deeply inappropriate to interrupt a performance of secular music, how much more is it wildly inappropriate to interrupt the corporate worship of the living God by the church of Jesus Christ? And by the way, what more important call can you get than the call to worship him in just a few moments? So turn off your phone now. Stir up your heart to bring the highest, most zealous praise to Christ our King.
Hear the word of God now from Psalm 27 as we are called into his worship by it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Let's begin to behold the beauty of our God by standing and singing hymn number 281, Rejoice the Lord is King, hymn 281. Since the 1640s, we as Presbyterians have confessed the exact same 33 doctrines for the last 380 years. All our elders, all our deacons, all our ministers must subscribe to these doctrines and say, this is my doctrine. This is the theology, our public theology that we have held to with gladness again for almost four centuries. Let's confess our faith now in our understanding of good works, obedience, and fruit, which we will be addressing very clearly in the preaching of the word. Christian, what do you believe?
Please take your copy of God's Word now and turn to Psalm 1 for our Old Testament reading. Psalm 1, a very familiar text. Many of you I know have this memorized. Psalm 1, of course, as being part of the canon of Holy Scripture, is inspired, inerrant, and authoritative. Give careful attention now. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Man shall not live by bread alone. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, tells us that it's prudent and wise to give as an act of worship. He says in Proverbs chapter 3, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Let's pray together. Our Father, enable us now to joyfully give you our tithes and offerings as an act of obedient worship, demonstrating that we will not have any other gods before you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
These are the prayers of God's people. Would you please join me? Lift them up to the Lord. Dear Lord and our Heavenly Father, we are here before you this morning to offer our corporate prayer, the one of your church. Remember us, Lord, hear our prayer because you promise to do so, that you may be glorified in your Son, Jesus Christ. You said, he who turns his ear away from listening to the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Father, remember you have delivered us from that dreaded status because we believe that Jesus is our savior, our intercessor, who presents the prayers of his sheep, those that believe in him to you most holy at your throne. We confess and thank you that you have caused by your Holy Spirit caused us to be born again through repentance and faith in Jesus. With the conviction of sin and new hearts to believe, he is Lord of all. Grant us a new refreshing confidence for where we have sinned against you, Lord. You are in heaven. Jesus makes intercession for us. Jesus at death takes our souls and spirits to be with him. It is Jesus who will return in all his glory to raise all from the dead, judge the wicked, and raise our righteous bodies to be forever with the Lord. We thank you, Lord. Our prayers are not an abomination to you because Jesus never turned his ear away from listening to the law, but perfectly fulfilled it on our behalf, every jot and tittle of it. And then he imputed his righteousness to us. If, Lord, there are any in this room today who have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation, would you please convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and call them to repentance and faith in you? Lord, you said, other sheep have I that are not of this fold, and you have commissioned us to send or go to all nations that you may call them to yourself. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have pro prospered our church with faithful men and resources to train and preachers to the nations to go. We pray for open doors for your word that we and they may speak forth the mystery of Christ and make it clear how we ought to speak in all the midst of evil, perilistic thought in our land and in the world, cause your light, Lord, to shine, cause many to turn to Christ and repent. Did not you say there is wheat among the tares of the fields, and they are white for harvest? Lord, make us part of it. Keep this church pure and true to your word, led by men valiant for truth until the Lord Jesus returns. You've been faithful to do that for these many years. Lord, please continue. Lord, we, are, we use our resources for you. Keep us diligent to train men in the way of the Lord. We pray for our country, for those in leadership, for those in power because of wealth and influence. Strike down the wicked, Father, and give us godly leaders, men who fear you and love righteousness. We claim your promises that the wicked shall not prosper, and you will build your church on your blessed truth, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. O oh Lord, do again in our times the great deeds you used to do. We will continue for your glory. Be merciful when you're angry. We pray, Lord Jesus, you would intercede with us, for us, for your people here at Woodruff Road. You see, look at us, we are praying together as one body right now. Hear our prayer, O Lord. And we have those among us, along with loved ones, and family and friends, and fellow workers and neighbors who have not received your grace of repentance and faith. We have those who are seated in this room, this very room, who are watching the webcast, whose loved ones as of yet do not believe in your wonderful salvation, freedom, and joy. 
We ask for their sanctification, O oh Lord, and salvation. O oh Lord, how hard it is for us, for those of us uh, wives who live with unbelieving husbands, earnestly desiring to be knit to you in fellowship with them in Christ, Husbands here that have unbelieving wives who will not bow the knee and bend the neck to your sovereignty and grace. Have mercy, O Lord, how we long for your perfect plan and commands for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives to submit to a Christ-loving husband and children to obey their parents, honor their parents as you have commanded. O Lord, how we long for that and storm your throne, as it were, for your grace and mercy. Should you not give us this wonderful blessing, give us faith, love, and patience, endurance, and joyful perseverance to enjoy and obey your word. We thank you for our week of VBS, all the workers last week. We thank you for them, for the facilities we have, the young ones who have come, Lord, we ask you to pierce their hearts with your irresistible grace. For our sons may be as grown-up plants and our daughters as corner pillars, fashioned as for a palace, beautiful and dependable and united to Christ. Lord, we must always beseech you for those of us who are suffering from physical and emotional pain, the ravages of age, or the diseases of youth our due judgment for the sin of Adam, our Father. You, O Lord, are glorified when you heal us or give us talented doctors and nurses who help us to endure. Give us patience and joy and understanding and hope that you would, that this world is not our home. And we look for an eternal city whose builder and maker is God. Apply and grant your grace to those of us who have lost husbands, wives, even children and parents to death. Grant us wisdom, especially for our widows, Lord, and perseverance in loneliness and joy in the resurrection and promise of Jesus, our Savior. Now open our hearts as we worship you by hearing your preached word. Let it, see, let it sink deep down into our ears, our hearts and souls that you would be glorified. And all of God's people said, Amen. Please take your copy of God's Word once again and turn to John 15 for our New Testament writing, reading. John 15, let's stand together as we reverence the Word of God. This too is God's holy Inerrant word, John 15, reading verses 8 through 11. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. You, Please take your Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to Psalm 32a. Psalm 32a.
My three dearest friends and greatest teachers over the last 40 years have been John Calvin, the leading reform thinker who died in Geneva in 1559, who cannot be ignored by any serious student of the word and doctrine. Thomas Boston, the Scottish Presbyterian pastor who died in 1732, who has taught me so much about covenant theology and how to value Christ. But my dearest friend, and he hangs there on my wall, looking down on me, looking very stern, is Benjamin Morgan Palmer, the pastor of First Presbyterian Church Columbia and then of New Orleans, who died in 1982. And about our text today, Palmer said this, while the other three Gospels record the parables, the actions, the fragmentary discourses of Jesus, they are largely external. We certainly see Jesus there and instantly admire him and adore him there. But when we come to John's Gospel, and when we come to the last few chapters, Palmer continues, it is as though we've been allowed entrance into a private conversation with Jesus. And when we come to this discourse, the farewell discourse, we have now been admitted into the very holy of holies, the Bible's innermost shrine. When we come to John 13 through 17, we have an almost verbatim transcript of everything Jesus said on that Thursday night before his arrest. Now let me remind you of, very briefly, of the background where we've been. It's when we open John 15, it's Thursday night in Jerusalem. It's Passover. Jesus and his 12 disciples have met in an upper room. Jesus begins the meeting by washing their feet. And then he tells them they ought to wash one another's feet. He prophesies that Judas will betray him. Jesus issues the new commandment that we are to love one another as he has loved us. Jesus prophesies that Peter will deny him three times before sunup. Jesus then comforts and encourages the remaining 11, for Judas is now left, by promising them a heavenly home. Jesus tells them how to get to that heavenly home through him, the only way. He tells his disciples they will do greater works than him. And he promises to give his disciples the Holy Spirit in all his fullness, the Spirit who will indwell them, teach them the truth of the word, and bring all things to their remembrance. And Jesus tells them, as he will tell them repeatedly through the evening, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then at the close of chapter 14, notice how the scene shifts physically. We read Jesus saying, arise, let us go from here. Now the context begins to move. Until now it's been stationary. In John 13 and 14, Jesus and the 12 and the 11 have been seated around the table having Passover. But now they stand up. They file down the steps. They trek through the dark streets of Jerusalem. They go across the brook Kidron, headed over to the Garden of Gethsemane. And all of John 15 and 16 take place on the move. And we'll see even tonight that Jesus has, before the very sight of his disciples, he has physical, visible references, illustrations right there that they can reach out and touch. Jesus is walking and talking as he goes to the place where he will be arrested. Now, I want to tell you, this text today is going to stretch your mind, but it will pay great dividends. It contains close reasoning and analogical thinking, and so let me encourage you with the words of the Apostle Peter. Gird up the loins of your mind. Keep your copy of God's Word open because we will be digging deep into it this morning. Let's pray together. O oh, Sovereign Lord, you have given this very text by divine inspiration, and you have promised us that it will be profitable for us. It will profit us for doctrine. It will profit us for reproof. It will profit us for correction and for instruction in righteousness, that we might be complete, mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So take this word, press it deep into our minds and hearts, deepen our trust in Christ, strengthen our love to him, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our text, if you are looking at it in John 15, beginning in verse 8, 
Our text is talking primarily about union with Christ. Now, you'll remember in the first seven verses of John 15, Jesus draws a metaphor. He paints a picture. He says, if you look up just above our context, I am the vine, you are the branches. Cut off from me, there is no life. And he's talking about saving union with Christ. We come into this saving union by faith in him and repentance. Synonyms of union with Christ would include saved, vitally connected. But how do you know this is a reality in anyone's life, your own beginning with? The answer is far simpler than we want it to be. We want this to be difficult and complex and there to be no answer. We've muddied this in our day. Jesus nor the apostles ever say that your name being on a church roll is proof of union with Christ. Over and over again, Jesus drives us back to one proof that union with Christ has occurred. Look at verse 8 very carefully. Jesus says there, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be or prove to be my disciples. Jesus makes an analogy between nature and grace. He says spiritual life is just like natural life. And at that moment, as Jesus says these words, he's probably walking by a field containing luxuriant grapevines. The vineyards of Palestine preached spiritual realities. If there is a real and vital union between a vine and a branch, what will occur? Fruit. You know that the branch is getting its life from the vine because you see the fruit on the end. If there is real and vital union between Christ and any person, what will occur in 100% of the cases? Fruit. No fruit. No attachment to Christ. Now, thankfully for us, when we use that fundamental principle of hermeneutics, compare scripture with scripture, fruit is repeatedly defined. Fruit means godly character traits. Remember those nine traits that are called fruit in Galatians chapter 5? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The issue of fruit bearing as the evidence of the reality of union with Christ is repetitious in the teaching of Christ. Now, what I want you to do is really roll up your sleeves and go to work with me here. Look at Matthew 7. And what I want you to see is Jesus doesn't just sort of talk about this ad hoc or once in a while. He repeatedly brings up this issue that fruit is the evidence. (coughs) In Matthew 7... Verse 16, Jesus speaks of the impossibility of a bad tree, trees being representative of people bearing good fruits. And so Jesus says in Matthew 7, this is the close of the Sermon on the Mount, verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, listen to the statement of Jesus. Every, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Every, there it is again, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then Jesus cinches this with a statement about cognition. He says in verse 20, therefore by their fruits you will know them. He says it's an evidence that somebody has union with Christ. It's it's an evidence that they as a branch are connected to the vine. Fruit. No tree can hide their identity for long. Notice what Jesus says here in Matthew 7, verse 18. He says, he denies the negative, what trees won't produce. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. It's a matter of settled agreement that a good tree is not going to produce Sickly, unhealthy, bitter fruit. It's equally agreed upon that a diseased tree is not going to produce healthy fruit. And then Jesus affirms the positive, what trees will produce. Look at Matthew 7, 17. Every 
good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Jesus is stressing that the fruit of the tree or the life of the man will always be in keeping with the nature of the tree. And so if I ask you today to accompany me to an orchard and said to you, we're going to identify trees. Would you need to bring a shovel so that you could dig them up and examine the roots? No. Would you need to bring an axe so you could chip off some bark and examine it? No. All you would need to do is look at the outermost branches of the tree and say, those are peaches, Carl. This must be a peach tree. In a few cases, you might need to pull a sample off the tree and take a bite and say, ah, nectarines. But there's no digging required. There's no complex analysis needed. A simple examination is all. That's why Jesus says these very simple words in Matthew 7, 20. By their fruits, you will know them. By the external evidence. One that's evident to anybody without any special training. If it looks like, smells like, tastes like an apple, it's empirical. You also can look at fruit that is discolored or smells bad, or is misshapen, or is missing, and you can say easily, that's bad fruit. If you want to know what kind of tree it is, look at the fruit. Even if you know nothing about horticulture, you've never been a member of the garden club, you understand the fundamental assertions that Jesus is making. Jesus is making a profound point about your life and mine, namely this, the fruit, the evidence of our actions and words demonstrate beyond dispute what's in our heart and who we truly are. The test is not verbal profession. We will hear Jesus say repeatedly that there are plenty of self-proclaimed prophets, teachers, who will say, Lord, Lord, and say they're converted and gifted, and they will say this up until the last judgment when Jesus corrects them. Profession is not the acid test. It is evident fruit. Stare at verse 8 back in our text in John 15. Now, I want you to think about the spiritual truths of our text. Listen carefully. When you look at verse 8, good men, converted men, regenerate men, do evident good works. According to Matthew 25 on the last day, the last judgment, Jesus is going to point to men's fruit and good works and say, this is the proof. This is the evidence, the fruit of your conversion. Evil men do evil deeds. Isn't that Paul's point in Galatians 5 when he says the works of the flesh are evident? And so is the fruit. But over the last 50 years, there has been a ground-shaking movement in theology. The advancement of a view, at least it was known at the beginning of the movement, now it's called other things, but at the beginning it was known as and put into print as the carnal Christian theory. This view, which has been widely promoted over the last 50 years, and if you're younger than me, you've never known a day when this view wasn't being promoted heavily. Perhaps you've been discipled under this movement or attended churches who taught this. The carnal Christian theory says that a man can be saved, have union with Christ, be on his way to heaven, and live like the devil and never bear any fruit. The sad thing is such a view was disproved a thousand years before God came in the flesh. Listen to David, the words we just read a moment ago in our Old Testament reading in Psalm 1. David, writing a thousand years before Christ, says... Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He will bring forth fruit in his season. Don't be mistaken. The real evidence of spiritual life, of conversion, of union with Christ is not a loud profession. But it's the steady, growing development of godly character traits, a fruit. What the Puritans used to call the life of God in the soul of man. Now let me tell you what fruit isn't, because people came here today mistaken about this. Here's what fruit is not. Not respectability, 
not something which can be imposed by any person. Fruit is not to be confused with good habits, which a person forms in their childhood, like holding doors and saying, yes, sir, and cleaning your rooms. These are just decency or civility. It's not supernatural power. By the way, I'm not opposed to decency and civility in making your bed, but that's not fruit. Here's what fruit is. It's growth in godly character traits. Look at one of the great words that Jesus uses in John 15, verse 8. He says, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. We could even translate the term there, growing or increasing fruit. And so the, the evidence that a man has union with Christ is that man is being, con, is being progressively conformed to the image of Christ. If you take that chart of nine character traits in Galatians 5, he has a growing love. He has a burgeoning self-control. He has a deepening peace, a surging of long-suffering, a proliferation of kindness, a swelling of goodness, a multiplication of faithfulness, a surging increase of gentleness, and a rising tide of joy. One of the most troubling things that I encounter on a weekly basis as a pastor is people have made a profession of faith for the last 50 years, and there's no fruit. There's no growth in these character traits, but they grow grumpier, more unloving, more sour, more unkind. And when inquired about it, they say, I made a profession of faith 50 years ago. My friend, look at what Jesus says in verse 8. Bearing much fruit, increasing, growing fruit. Now let me move on. Look at verse 8 as well. Jesus has just talked about the proof of union with Christ. It's fruit. Then he talks about the goal of union with Christ. Look at verse 8 again. He says in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. If fruit is the proof of union with Christ, what is the goal? Why does Jesus want us to be in vital union with him? Well, what is man's chief end in everything? You don't have to go past week one of our catechids class on Wednesday nights to know this. Shorter catechism one, what is man's chief end in everything? According to the catechism, it's to glorify God. It is to the praise and credit. Stare at that little clause in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified. It is to the praise and credit of the divine horticulturist, the Father, when we bear fruit. It shows his knowledge and wisdom and diligence when his branches yield an abundance of fruit. When formerly unproductive people have no fruit, and then they begin to bear good fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, God is praised. Think of Paul, an angry, hateful, murderous man. If you would have been standing with a group of people and you would have looked at Paul's fruit, you would have said, there is no fruit there. Gentleness, kindness, self-control, no. He's marked by anger and a sharp tongue. Oh, well, he certainly knows his Old Testament. But there's no growth or even presence of godly character. But then when he is transformed almost overnight by conversion, as soon as he's united to Christ, and he becomes that man who writes these words, the greatest of these is love in 1 Corinthians 13. That glorifies God. We glorify God because we are showing his character to the world. Let us never grow confused on this point. How do we glorify God? Look at verse 8. Not by the multiplication of gimmicks and programs, but by the increase of holiness. That's how we glorify God. Then look at verse 9, and we talk about the love discovered in union with Christ. Verse 9, I confess my reticence to even talk about this, because we are so unworthy to speak it or hear it. This text contains a subject of which the true believer can never tire, nor can they ever fathom. It's the deepest, richest, most profitable theme that I can ever set before you. It is always in season. 
I'm speaking of the great theme of Christ's love for his people. Christ's love for you and I, and this is staggering to consider, is just like the Father's love for him. Look at the analogy that's made in verse 9. Look carefully at your text. As or like the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Jesus is saying, you know that, that love the Father has for me? It's just like the love I have for you. The Father never started to love the Son. He's always loved him. And in perfect analogy, Christ has always loved you. Ephesians 1 tells us that before the foundation of the world, before God in six days spoke the galaxies into existence, Christ loved you. Jesus never doubted his Father's love for him. We're repeatedly told about this love. In John 3, that we looked at, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago in our exposition. In John 3, Jesus says, just flatly, just sort of as a passing comment, the Father loves the Son. The Father's love for the Son is immutable, never wavering. We know that. We know that the Father's love for the Son has always been present. No one would dispute it. But it's the analogy that we find hard to grasp. Because the analogy Jesus is making is saying, just as the Father loves me, so I love you. Just so. Just as the Father loves him, the Son has always loved you. From before creation, he loved you. He set his affection on you. That's why the Apostle Paul will say in Ephesians 3 that you and I cannot begin to fathom the height, the depth, the length, the breadth of Christ's love for you. Christ's love for you is immutable. It cannot fade. Do you remember what Paul writes in Romans 8? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, or depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But there's something that makes this analogy even richer. Look back at verse 9. The analogy of the love the Father has for the Son and the love of his, the Son for his people breaks down in a key place. You see, the love of the Father for the Son was richly merited and deserved. Why would you not love the Son? He's perfect in every possible way. But Christ's love to us is completely and always undeserved. Christ had always done the Father's will. And so it was easy for the Father to love him. But not us. Guilty. Depraved. Rebellious. Spiritually dead. That's who the Son loved. Romans 5.8 is the great text expounding this point when Paul says, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is how God shows his love for us. He finds us at our lowest spot and loves us. Christ's love for his people is the deepest, most profitable theme that I could bring to you. It's always suitable. But do you hear what Jesus is saying in verse 9? Look clearly at it. He's saying, my love for you is not like any love you've ever known. It's not like any earthly love. The only analogy to my love for you is the deep, immutable, passionate affection that the persons of the Godhead have for one another. Now, I have to stop and beat a drum that I've been beating all through the farewell discourse. On nine previous occasions so far in the farewell discourse, I have pointed out Jesus' Trinitarian teaching. This makes a tenth occasion. This is the most repeated topic. If you go through and you have your theological grid in place, what you will find is the most repeated doctrine that Jesus teaches in the farewell discourse is this, Trinitarianism. By Trinitarianism, I mean not the lonely, brooding God of Islam, one God eternally existing in one lonely person, but the Trinitarian God, one God eternally existing in three co-equal persons.
persons. Our culture says the doctrine of the Trinity is outdated and impractical. Jesus says, I'll show you practical. How many of you have ever struggled with the question, am I loved by God? Jesus says, here's the doctrine I will call upon to convince you of my love for you. It's the inner Trinitarian relationship of the persons of the Godhead and their love for one another. That's the fixed refer reference point, and I can say to you, my love for you, sinner, is just like the persons of the Trinity. Christ's love for you is not just talk. It's action, as love always is. Because of his love, he took flesh. Because of his love, he suffered untold humiliation. Christ's love for you is deeply personal. Look at the immediate, intimate encouragement we get when we read these words in verse 9. Look at what Jesus says. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. This is what you and I long to hear. When Christ says, I've set my affection on you, and I will not, cannot change. This is what your soul longs for, to hear and know from Christ. Now notice what Jesus says in verse 9. He could have said, the second person of the Godhead loves the church corporate. That's not what he says. He says in verse 9, I have loved you. Then Jesus tells them to do something. Look at the close of verse 9. Immediately after he speaks of his love, he says, abide in my love. He's commanding continuance or perseverance. How do we continue in the love of Christ? Now you really have to roll up your sleeves. Look at verse 10, the next text. Jesus tells us how to continue in his love, how to abide. He says, if you keep my commandments. You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How do we continue in the love of Christ? We are told in verse 10, by obeying his commandments. Think of some of the commandments that Christ has given us. When Jesus says in Matthew 16, an imperative, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. We abide in his love by keeping that commandment. Or think of what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We abide in his love by keeping that commandment. Or what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Don't lay up treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We abide in his love by keeping that commandment. When a man submits to Christ's authority and rule and yields a cheerful and habitual obedience to these commandments. When he renounces his own will and wisdom then he's continuing in the love of Christ. Look at the believer's life of obedience when he's in union with Christ. Stare at verse 10. And I want to show you a portrait of a man who's in union with Christ. He's obedient. Jesus keeps drawing that analogy. Remember that analogy that's being set up for us here in verse 8 through 11, where Jesus says, the relationship of me to the Father is just like your relationship with me. He keeps drawing the relationship, the analogy, over and over again in verse 10. He says, just like I can keep my Father's commands and abide in the Father's love, so you must keep my commands and abide in my love. Jesus abides in his Father's love by commandment keeping. He's the second or the last Adam. Whereas the first Adam did not continue in faithful abiding by obedience, Jesus does so perfectly. Now listen to me carefully. When you look at verse 10, in some of you there's going to be this natural recoiling, saying, Carl, you just lost me. I may sit in my pew for a little while longer, but mentally I may be sitting down, but on the outside I'm standing up and headed for the coffee and on the inside. Because we live in an age that wants nothing to do with these concepts, obedience, commands, duty, law. But look at verse 10, what Jesus says. Keeping the commandments is addressed as the means of abiding. Abiding in Christ's love, according to Jesus, is not somehow a mystical experience. It's simple, purposeful obedience. It's when a man keeps Christ's commandments that he is abiding in Christ's love. Jesus says so. 
Now, I want you to stop with me and pull back for just a moment. Look at your watch that Thursday night. The time is drawing near. Jesus now has this much more to say to his disciples. He's headed for his arrest and then his cross. These are some of his last words. And what is he passionate to communicate? The vital necessity of obedience to the law of God. Think of how many times we've already heard this. We heard it in John 14 twice. This is the first. And then next week we'll hear the second time in John 15. Are you tired of this emphasis by now? This emphasis upon Christ's commandments and obeying them? If so, the fault is in us and not the commandments. Because do you remember what Jesus says when he speaks of his commandments in Matthew 11? He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Once again, appeal is made to Christ's own example. Look at verse 10. He kept the Father's commandment and thus abides continually in the Father's love. He obeyed his Father cheerfully, universally, meaning he kept all the Father's commands. Promptly, he never stalled or dragged his feet in obedience and perseveringly. And this is how we abide, by obeying the commands of Christ. All of this, Carl, all of this sounds very austere and legal. Wrong. Look at verse 11, where Jesus connects the dots for us between... Carl, do you dare say these two words in the same sentence? Obedience and joy. Do you hear that? Jesus says there's this vital link between obedience and joy. Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Up until now, Jesus has not talked about joy in the farewell discourse. But this text is the first of seven in the farewell discourse where Jesus will talk about joy. He says in verse 11, he's spoken these things to them that their joy may be full. What are these things? His directive to abide in his love by obedience. How will their joy be made full? By obedience. A disobedient Christian cannot be a joyful Christian. A wandering prodigal believer cannot be a happy believer. Holy obedience is the means to joy. We're talking about that joy the psalmist speaks of in Psalm 1 when he says, His delight is in the law of the Lord. This is why the psalmist cries out in Psalm 51 after he's been in perverse disobedience and repents. And he cries out to God, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Through disobedience, he'd lost his joy. No one is more miserable than a believer in disobedience. He doesn't love sin enough to really enjoy its pleasures, but he doesn't love Christ enough to pursue holiness and delight in it. But Carl, what about the reality of suffering and affliction? <clears throat> How can anyone be joyful in the midst of affliction? Well, Jesus was the greatest of sufferers and also the most joyful man. Remember what we're told of Jesus in Hebrews 12, verse 2, that we are to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. His joy was not based on getting a new possession, seeing a comedy. His joy was steady from the manger to the cross. His joy could not be derailed even in the face of mockery and abuse, hardship and humiliation. It was a joy in the prospect of death. Remember Jesus, we are told, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Yet for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Paul shows us again, you can be joyful even in the midst of affliction. You remember Paul writes from a jail in Philippians 4 and he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How do we apply this word? First, let me ask you today. Are you joyless, melancholy, depressed? The means of acquiring joy is not going to be the pursuit of carnal experiences, but the passionate pursuit of obedience to Christ's commands. That's what our text says. Will you believe him? Take him at his word that he will give you joy if you give yourself to glad submission to his commands. 
My friend, you've been looking for joy in all the wrong places. Joy can be found in Christ, in union with him, obeying his commands. Another application. When Jesus says in verse 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands. We all know what it's like to obey somebody who doesn't understand how hard obedience is. Some of you men, did you have that boss, that boss on your first job who said, now uh, I need you to dig uh, 30 holes, five feet deep, and I'll be back in about an hour to see that you've dug them. Okay, and as he walks away, you mutter and say, that guy couldn't dig one hole of his life depended on it. And you know that it's an impossible task. But that's not the case with Jesus. Look at verse 10. He speaks of his obedience to the Father's commands. He knows what it's like to be tempted to disobey. He's fully man with all the temptations to sin, but he's fully man without sin. He never once disobeyed his Father's commands. When you are tempted to disobey God's clear commands, run to this one. Run to Jesus and say, Christ, give me that same strength to obey that you exhibited for 33 years. Another application. Do you think little of joy when you see these words? Do you think little of it? My friends, joy is at the core of the Christian life. Christ wants you to have joy. Paul says that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. My friends, pursue joy, as Paul commands, rejoice always, by striving after obedience and thus abiding in Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, how we thank you that our Jesus has loved us with an everlasting love, much longer than worlds have even existed. And we ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would be busily at work in us, producing much fruit, so much so that the whole world could easily see that we have vital union with Christ. We ask that in days to come, as we give ourselves to serious obedience to your holy will, that you would pour out joy upon us. Not the frivolous chasing after more and more carnal experiences, but the satisfying doing of your commands. We pray with thanksgiving and expectancy in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now as we start making our way to the Lord's table, take your Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to hymn 340 as we stand and sing, There is a fountain filled with blood. Let's stand as we sing.
is given this table for the strengthening of your joy. As you come to this table, renewing your commitment to Christ, let me encourage you now to put off all causes for sadness. The only cause, of course, for sadness is sin. Put off all reason for sadness by repentance. Recommitting yourself to full dependence on the saving, sanctifying grace of Christ. If you've been baptized and are a communing member in good standing of any evangelical church, this table is for you. But if you've not entered into union with Christ by repenting of your sins and believing the gospel, please let these elements pass you by. Let's pray together. Father of mercy and God of all grace, we thank you now for the immeasurable gift of your son Jesus, who is to us the bread of life. We know that by feeding on him, we shall live forever. And we thank you for this glorious sacrament of communion that you have given to all who know you. Enable us now to discern the Lord's body and so partake in a right and worthy manner, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every time we gather for the sacrament, we remind you of the words of institution. The table you see set before us is not the design of any man. It is given by Christ, the Son of God, who ordained this for us. This picture, you may think, I could think of a better picture. No, you couldn't. This is the only authorized picture of Jesus that exists. This is it. This is the picture of his body and his blood. Listen to the words of institution the Apostle Paul records for us. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and gave it to his disciples.
night before he went to the cross for us, Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Our Father, we gather once again to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, that he took humble flesh, that he came all the way down. We thank you for his sinless life, his perfect obedience without which we would be lost. We trust that you have given Christ for us, and so we receive this bread as a symbol, a token of your love for us. Truly feed us the bread of life and give us grace, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the cup also and gave it to his disciples.
While in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper by saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it. Our Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We praise you that because of Jesus' blood, we are now accepted in the Beloved, and we have access to your holy presence. As we have partaken of this cup, O Lord, we once again renew our reliance on Jesus as our only Redeemer, our only Mediator. Without Him, we have no hope, no righteousness of our own. And so we take this cup from your hand, O God, as your seal that you have forgiven our sins, united us to Christ, and washed us in His blood. We pray through Jesus our Lord. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to do two things at once. We're going to receive a deacon's offering, and we're going to stand and sing hymn 465, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. Each time we take communion, this is the ancient tradition of the historic church, we always receive a diaconal offering. Every month, your deacons help and assist people in pews right next to you who need food and clothing and rent and house payments and car payments, real needs. They also help and assist some of our missionaries on the field with their diaconal needs. And so let me encourage you to give generously at that time. Let's stand together as we sing and give. The Lord's Day has only begun. We hope that you'll join us now for a time of refreshments in the Fellowship Hall and then for our excellent Sunday school classes. Once again, if you're a college student, head to the library. Silas Menezes will be teaching our College Plus class. 
Or if you're visiting with us and just want to know more about Woodruff Road, head to that Glaston penalty box right back there. And that's where Pastor Dodds will be teaching our intro class today on baptism. And then tonight, close out the Lord's Day with us in worship at 6 p.m. as we continue our series on the life of Samuel. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.